The storm of 1913 is arguably the deadliest November gale in the history of the Great Lakes, bringing those unlucky enough to be crossing at the wrong time to their freshwater graves. This horrifying November witch claimed 12 ships as its victims and wrecked 25 others on shore, and even burying cities such as Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, and Milwaukee in heavy snow and ice that knocked down power lines and damaged the city's buildings. More than 270 sailors lost their lives as the deadliest storm in recorded Great Lakes history pulled several vessels to their grave on their lake bed. Stay tuned for the full story about the Great Lakes storm of 1913. are five massive bodies of fresh water, with the five lakes being Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. With the largest and deepest lake being Lake Superior, the smallest being Lake Ontario, the shallowest being Lake Erie, and Lake Huron being the one with the longest coastline. The lakes are bordered by the province of Ontario, Canada, as well as the U.S. states of New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. With the lakes created thousands of years ago after melting glaciers during the last ice age, each of the five lakes are large and deep enough to be home to sea life, and for centuries they have played a huge role in trade and transportation across the U.S. and Canada. Surprisingly, all of the lakes are connected to each other. For example, Lake Superior and Lake Huron are connected by the St. Mary's River, Lake Huron and Lake Michigan are connected by the Straits of Mackinac, Lake Huron and Lake Erie are connected by the St. Clair and Detroit Rivers, which join together at Lake St. Clair. And finally, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario are connected by the Niagara River, which is home to the famous Niagara Falls. However, due to the falls, ships can't traverse the Niagara River. Instead, they use the Welland Canal. Plus, the lakes are connected to the Atlantic by the St. Lawrence River. But due to the fact that most lake freighters were too big to fit through the locks of the St. Lawrence Seaway, most of the freighters were confined to the Great Lakes area. The average size of lake freighters at the turn of the 20th century was anywhere between 400 to 500 feet or 121 to 152 meters. But while the largest ones were over 600 feet long, the title Queen of the Lakes goes to the longest ship operating on the Great Lakes. Lake freighters actually weren't the only ships that operate on the, on the lakes. There were also car ferries and passenger ships that operated on the Great Lakes. The most common cargo that lake freighters carried was iron ore. Typically, these freighters carried the iron ore from the mine through the northern part of the Great Lakes to the mills in the southern part of the lakes, where the iron ore is then turned into iron and steel. Iron ore wasn't the only cargo that lake freighters carry, however. Lake freighters also transport cargo such as coal, taconite, and potash. And in order to make the maximum profit, most lake freighters were underpowered and were usually only equipped with a single 1,000 to 1,100 horsepower triple expansion engine, which isn't a huge number when compared to similarly sized cargo ships built at the time for the open ocean. These ships were equipped with engines like this because they were cheaper to build and were more fuel efficient. Also, the captains on the Great Lakes were under immense pressure to transport as much cargo as possible as late into the year as they possibly could before the lakes froze over in the winter month. Due to this, shipwrecks have basically become a common thing on the Great Lakes not only due to the gales that rage over the lakes in the fall and winter, but also because there are a lot of hazards such as shoals and reefs that can be very dangerous to ships. Because of this, there are hundreds of lighthouses, lightships, and large buoys from the Great Lakes that could also aid in ships in storms, but they would make no difference in the storm of 1913. The SS H.B. Hoggett was a large steel-hulled freighter that, although she wasn't the largest on the lakes at the time, she was a decent-sized freighter that came in at 434 feet or 132 meters long and had a beam of 50 feet. She was constructed in 1903 by the American Shipbuilding Company in Lorain, Ohio. She was launched in 1903 and was put into service later that year. On Sunday, November 9th, 1913, the Hoggett, under the command of Captain A.C. May, was sailing north up Lake Huron when Captain May realized that the storm, which had been raging over Lakes Superior and Lake Michigan since Friday the 7th, was starting to grow worse, and he decided to turn south to seek refuge in the safety of the St. Clair River to keep his crew and his vessel safe. Captain May realized that a new storm front was moving east towards southern Lake Huron, meaning that the ships that turned south were now heading straight into danger. 
As night fell, the Hoggin was basically sailing blind, while Captain May was making his search for the St. Clair River. He was concerned that they were very close to land. He shouted to the wheelsman to turn the ship back toward the open lake to keep the ship from running aground. But the wheelsman knew that if they turned back toward the open lake, their ship would capsize in the massive waves. So he defied Captain May's orders and let the Hoggin run aground at the beach at Port Huron, only 100 feet or 30 meters from the Lake Huron Hotel. On the morning of the 10th, it was discovered that the Hoggin would have sunk if she didn't beach. But that was not the only ship that grounded in order to survive. The SS Howard M. Hanna Jr. was a 500 foot, 150 meter long, 5,905 gross registered ton freighter owned by the Hanna Transit Company. Just like the Hoggard, she was built by the American Shipbuilding Company in Lorraine. She was launched on April 28, 1908, and entered service later that year. On November 8, the Hanna, under the command of Captain William Hagen, left Lorraine bound for Fort William with a load of coal. In the early morning hours of November 9th, as the Hoggard was entering Lake Huron, it was clear that the storm was hanging towards them, and when the storm reached them, Captain Hagen couldn't even see the other end of his ship. Then, his crew spotted a light off the ship's side. The light was the Port Austin Lighthouse, only about 1,500 feet away from the Hannah. With only seconds to react, Captain Hagen dropped the ship's anchors, but it wasn't enough. The ship grounded only 500 feet from the lighthouse. In the brutal weather, the waves and winds caused her hull to crack, which flayed some of the ship's holds. Even the funnel was torn off. It drew weight out the storm, but when the storm cleared, despite the fact that she was heavily damaged, the ship survived and was later repaired and put back into service until she was scrapped in 1983. The two ships were heavily damaged in the storm, but they were both repaired and returned to service, and all of their crews survived the ordeal. The storm of 1913 claimed 12 ships as its victims and stranded 19 ships, including the Hannah and the Hoggood. They were the lucky ones to survive the deadliest storm in the history of the Great Lakes. Though as fate would have it, other ships were not as lucky and were consumed by the powerful force of the storm. Despite how modern and advanced these vessels were, the lakes will always be bigger and stronger than any vessel caught in their grip. The fact that the Great Lakes are much different than the world's oceans, the design of Great Lakes freighters makes them much different than from ocean-going cargo ships. Most freighters had a superstructure divided between two islands, with the forward island containing the pilot house, which gave captains better visibility, and the second island over the engine room containing the boiler uptake and some of the crew spaces. The very first vessel to adopt this design was the R.J. Hackett, a 208-foot wooden hulled freighter that was launched on November 16, 1869. This design would soon become the blueprint for both American and Canadian cargo vessels operating on the Great Lakes, even when their wooden hulls were replaced with steel hulls, and when the largest ones were over triple the size of the Hackett. Due to the size of these new freighters, the crews were confident that they could stand up to even the worst storms the lakes would bring. And 1913 was a mild year for the Great Lakes region, and during the first few days of November in some areas, the temperatures were in the low 70s, but crews on board these vessels were aware that a November gale was on its way. They simply hoped that the storm would come after their final runs, and the storm was coming, and it was closing fast. The Lee Field was a Canadian registered grain carrier that came in at 1,454 gross registered tons, at a length of 248 feet or 76 meters, and a beam of 35 feet or 10 and a half meters. She was a British-built vessel constructed at the Strong Stepway Company shipyard in Sunderland, England. She was launched in 1892, and in 1900, she was sent to the Great Lakes after having been purchased for the steel trade for the mills at Sault Ste. Marie. On November 9, 1913, when the storm came, Leafield was steaming across Lake Superior bound for Midland, Ontario, when she was grounded up on rocks on an island in Lake Superior. Then, the monstrous waves pulled the ship back toward the open lake, and the ship was never seen again. None of the ship's 18 crew survived, and as of this video, the wreck of the Leaf Field remains undiscovered. The Wexford was a similar grain carrier built in Sunderland, England by William Doxford and Sons. The vessel was launched on March 24, 1883, and later that year, the ship was completed and put into service. The Wexford came in at 2,077 gross registered tons, and had a length of 250 feet or 76 meters, 
and had a beam of 40 feet or 12 meters, making her roughly the same size as the Lee Field. On November 9, 1913, Wexford was steaming across Lake Huron with a cargo of 96,000 bushels of wheat when the ship simply vanished in the storm without a word. No one knows how many people were on board the vessel at the time, but some estimates say that between 17 to 24 people could have been lost with the ship. Her fate remained a mystery until 2000 when she was discovered staying upright at the bottom of Lake Huron in 75 feet or 23 meters of water. On the 100th anniversary of the storm in 2013, a wreath was dropped on the wreck to commemorate her. The freighter Regina was a Canadian registered package freighter that was built for C.F. Plumer based in Montreal. Labeled hull number 419, she was constructed by the A. Macmillan and Sons shipyard in Dumbarton, Scotland. She was launched on September 4, 1907, and in October that year, the ship was put into service. She was similarly designed to, to similar Great Lakes freighters at the time, except it was smaller. She was 1,959 gross registered tons, measured 249 feet or 76 meters long, and had a beam of 42 feet or 13 meters. You could think of the Regina and similar freighters as being floating box trucks, because Regina was designed to visit small Canadian ports all across the lakes that larger freighters could not access. She typically transported cargo such as whiskey, champagne, materials for the hardware store, and much more. In 1912, ownership of the Regina was taken over by the Canadian Steamship Lines Incorporated, when her port of registry was moved to Toronto. On November 9, 1913, Regi the Regina was loading her cargo in Sarnia, Ontario, at the mouth of the St. Clair River on the southernmost tip of Lake Huron, and she was commanded by 34-year-old Captain Edward McConkie, who was a well-experienced Great Lakes Mariner and the Regina was his first command. At 7.30 a.m. on November 9th, the Regina departed Sarnia with a load of eight railroad cars, 140 tons of baled hay, as well as sewer and gas pipes stacked on her deck. She was bound for Northern Georgian Bay. Oddly, the sewer and gas pipes were stacked high above the rails on the ship's deck, and one of the spotters on the shore reported that the ship appeared top-heavy and that she was headed for trouble. By noon, the weather conditions over Lake Huron were starting to crank up. Another nearby freighter, the Charles S. Price, had turned south to seek refuge in the safety of the St. Clair River. It's unknown if Captain McConkie saw the Price, but he also decided to turn his ship around, which would mean turning his top-heavy ship into the wave for several minutes. But McConkie managed to get the ship turned around. But even when Regina's course was re reversed, visibility was almost nothing, and there was nothing on shore that any ship on Lake Huron could use aside from the Fort Gratiot Lighthouse, which was built to help guide ships into the St. Clair River. The, the Keeper of Light could even see the lights from other ships in the blizzard. While the Regina was nearing closer and closer to the Michigan side of the lake, Captain McConkie felt a vibration from deep within his vessel. The ship had grazed the lake bed. Shortly after, Regina developed a severe list, and the ship began to flood rapidly. The Regina was Captain McConkie's first command, and he knows that he's going to lose it. He desperately tried to evacuate his crew, but the captain stayed on the bridge, and he sent out a fog whistle that was heard on shore. But the crew who did manage to get into a lifeboat never made it to shore alive. Soon, debris and bodies from other ships, including the Regina, washed ashore. The wreck was found in 1986, three miles offshore and about 80 feet of water. Since the wreck is laying upside down, the pilot house collapsed and the body of Captain McConkie washed ashore on the Michigan side of the lake in August of 1914. It was later sent to Ontario for burial, and McConkie's wife dried out the diary in his pocket. The last entry was a recording of the weather on November 7th. The largest ship lost during the storm of 1913 was the Canadian grain freighter James Carruthers. Constructed earlier that year by the Collingwood Shipbuilding Company in Collingwood, Ontario, the James Carruthers was launched on May 22, 1913. She came in at 7,862 gross registered tons and measured 550 feet or 170 meters long and had a 50 foot or 18 meter beam. On November 6, 1913, the Carruthers, under the command of Captain William H. Wright, left Fort William, Ontario with 375,000 bushels of wheat bound from Midland, Ontario on Georgian Bay. While she was steaming across Lake Superior bound for the Sioux, her course lined up with another freighter, the SS J.H. Sheedle and the two ships were basically going to share courses with each other. The weather was good for the first day of the crossing, but on November 8th, 
before the Carruthers could even get to the Sioux locks. The storm side started to blow over Lake Superior. Luckily, the Carruthers and the Sheetle made it to the Sioux. But the next day, on November 9th, as they were sailing down the St. Mary's River, a nearby vessel noticed that the ship was restocking on coal near Detour, Michigan. After she was refueled, Carruthers nosed out of the St. Mary's River into Lake Huron, where the storm was starting to intensify. The Sheeta was still taking the same course as the Carruthers and could see the lights of the ship in the blizzard. Captain Wright of the Carruthers changed course to sail around Great Duck Island to sail in the less vulnerable part of the storm. The Sheeta's crew could still see the lights of the Carruthers, but soon they vanished. There would never be another confirmed sighting of the ship ever again. As of this video, the wreck of the James Carruthers has never been discovered. It remains the largest ship lost during the Great Lakes Storm of 1913. The second largest ship lost during the Storm of 1913 was the freighter Henry B. Smith, a ship that likely would not have been lost in the storm if her skipper had kept the ship in port. But due to a series of circumstances involving her captain and the company that owned the vessel, they did not stay in port. Labeled hull number 343, the Henry B. Smith was a large steel-hulled freighter constructed by the American Shipbuilding Company in Lorain, Ohio. The vessel was launched on May 2, 1906 and was completed on May 20 of that same month. She was among the largest freighters on the lakes at the time. She came in at 6,631 gross registered tons and measured 545 feet or 166 meters long and had a beam of 55 feet or 17 meters. The vessel was owned by the Acme Transit Company based out of Cleveland. Since her launch, she was commanded by Captain James Owen, a skipper with over 30 years of experience on the lakes. But there was one drawback that with Captain Owen and the ship's owners would play in the ship's loss. A freighter that stays in port doesn't make any profit, and the ship's owners were adamant that they generate as much profit as possible. And they didn't really seem to care about the safety of their crews as well. They also encouraged their ship to deliver their cargo on time. Captain Owen did keep the Smith in port when a storm came, and the company had issued an ultimatum to Captain Owen that he and the ship would arrive in port on time or the 1913 season would be his last with the company. On November 6, 1913, Henry B. Smith arrived at Marquette, Michigan to take on her cargo of 10,000 tons of iron ore. While the company was adamant that Captain Owen delivered the Smith's cargo on time regardless of the circumstances, the weather had other plans for the Great Lakes. Before the loading of the Smith began, Marquette was being overtaken by a huge blizzard, and when the iron ore was being loaded, the ore froze in the chutes of the ore dock. There was only one way that it could be freed, by climbing down the chutes and hammering the ore with sledgehammers. Most of the workers at the ore docks were not present due to the fact that it was very dangerous to load cargo in weather conditions like this, but Captain Owen needed the ship to sail as soon as the storm began. Finally, at roughly 5 p.m. on November 9th, the Henry B. Smith cleared the docks at Marquette and sailed out into Lake Superior. Other ships who were nearby at the docks felt that it was too risky to leave port in those conditions. The captain of a nearby freighter named the Choctaw paused the, the unloading of his vessel and didn't continue until the storm began to clear. Multiple witnesses on nearby vessels could even see the ship's deckhands still securing her hatches as she left port. It wasn't a good idea to sail into the storm without the vessel being watertight. In the blizzard, some could see massive winds crashing over the bow of the smith. Soon, Captain Owen realized that the storm was more than his vessel can handle, so he made an attempt to seek shelter at the safety of the Keweenaw Point Peninsula. This would be the final time anybody alive would see the ship for nearly a century. When the storm began to clear, Ports all along the Great Lakes waited to see if any ships made it to port. Many never did. While the Henry B. Smith left port, she never arrived at the Sioux Lock. Some hoped that she was one of only of the dozen or so vessels that stranded, but it was later confirmed that she was lost. Over the next several months, debris and bodies from ships, including the Smith, washed ashore. Over the years, majority of the freighters lost during the storm of 1913 were located, with a few located within a year of the storm. But it almost seemed like the Smith would never be found, and she slowly disappeared into the history books. But then, nearly a century later, something remarkable happened. In May of 2013, three shipwreck hunters known as Ken Merriman, Jerry Eliason, and Craig Smith set out to look for the ship. The team had already attempted to look for the wreck, and the previous attempts didn't find the ship. Until this time when their sonar scans showed an anomaly, but it could have been anything. 
The team sent down an ROV to take a look. At first, they only saw a pilot house. They could say that it was a steel that it was a steel freighter, but they couldn't confirm that it was what they were looking for. Until the next day, when they sent the ROV to the stern of the vessel and found the nameplate, it was in fact the Henry B. Smith. The wreck lays in about 535 feet of water, only 30 miles from, Mar from Marquette, her point of departure on her last voyage. It's still unknown on how the ship sank, but a lot of theories have come forward, ranging from a hull fracture or her hatches weren't all secure. But no one knows how. The Johnny McGean was a large steel hull freighter owned by Hutchinson and Company. Labeled hull number 359, she was constructed in 1908 by the American Shipbuilding Company in Lorain, Ohio. She was launched on February 22, 1908 and was delivered to her owners on April 3rd, that same year. She came in at 5,100 gross registered ton and measured 452 feet or 138 meters in length and had a beam of 52 feet or 16 meters. Not much is known about what happened to her on her final voyage, but we do know that she was sailing through Lake Huron when she was last seen at Octavus Point Lighthouse on November 9th, but her wreck was located in 1985. When she was launched in 1910, the Charles S. Price was one of the largest and most advanced freighters on the Great Lakes. Just like the Smith and the McGean, she was constructed by the American Shipbuilding Company in Lorain, Ohio. The freighter came in at 6,322 gross registered tons and measured 504 feet or 154 meters in length and had a beam of 54 feet or 16 meters. On November 8, 1913, the Price, under the command of Captain William Black, departed to Ashtabula, Ohio with a load of coal, operated by a crew of 28. But a few days before the price departed Ashtabula, the, sh the ship's first assistant engineer decided to leave the ship early because he feared that the price was headed for trouble. But it's unknown if the rest of the crew felt the same way. By the next day, the Charles S. Price was e exiting the St. Clair River and entering Lake Huron. But soon, the storm was moving towards mid-Lake Huron. So the Price decided to turn around to seek refuge in the safety of the St. Clair River. While she was doing this, the freighter Regina decided to also turn around as well. Not much else is known about what happened next, after, but after the storm cleared, a salvage tug was sent out to search Lake Huron for any signs of the crews that might need rescuing. Then, the captain of the salvage tug saw a mysterious sight. The bow of a steel freighter upturned on Lake Huron's surface. At first, it was assumed that it was the hull of the Regina. But after a diver was able to examine the wreck, it was confirmed that it was, in fact, the price. The bulk freighter Isaac M. Scott was a large steel hulled freighter constructed by the American Shipbuilding Company in Lorain, Ohio. She was launched on June 12, 1909, and was completed in July of that same year. She measured, she measured 524 feet, or 160 meters long, and came in at 6,372 gross registered tons. She sailed her maiden voyage on July 12, 1909, but her maiden voyage was not after good, to a good start. The same day she departed on her maiden voyage on July 12, she was steaming through Lake Superior a few miles off Whitefish Point, when in a dense fog, she rammed and sank the freighter John B. Cowell. The Cowell sank in minutes after she was rammed by the Scott, and only 10 out of her 24 crew survived. The bow of the Scott was not heavily damaged after the collision, but it did cost $30,000 in 1909 money in repairs, which is about $900,000 in today's money. And in the months after the incident, an inquiry was, was held to figure out who was to blame. And they figured out that the collision would have been avoided if the two ships were not sailing at full speed in the fog. But the scout would meet her own fate four years later. In the pre-dawn hours of November 9th, the Isaac M. Scout was loaded with over $22,000 in 1913 money uh, of coal in Cleveland bound for Milwaukee. Captain MacArthur had been the ship's skipper since her maiden voyage back in 1909. The Scout was just one of several freighters sailing up the St. Clair River at the time bound for Lake Huron. Communication with the ship was heard for a short time after she left port, but after she passed Tawas Point, the ship was had simply vanished in the brutal weather. Some of the bodies of the ship's crew washed ashore on the Ontario side of Lake Huron, but the wreck was not discovered until 1986. Over the course of just three days, four out of the five Great Lakes would claim at least one vessel. 
Lake Huron claimed eight ships, Lake Superior claimed two ships, and Lake Huron and Lake Erie claimed one ship. Another 25 ships were also stranded on shore, and over 273 sailors met their end in that fateful storm. It remains the deadliest storm in the history of the Great Lakes. Similar storms would last well into the 1960s and 70s and beyond when the lakes would claim their largest and most famous ship, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. <laughs>